Hello everyone, my name is Jessica Menhas and I'm the Communications Manager here at Mnemonic. With me is John Wolf, who is an internationally recognized leader with over 25 years of experience as an HSE Director and a Senior Director of Operations Integrity Audit for a global oil and gas company. He's here today to share with you his insights on internal audit best practices. So how are you, John? I'm great. Thank you, Jessica. And thanks for organizing this interview. Well, thank you, John, for taking time out for sharing your expertise. So my first question is, how should one structure an audit team and how many audits should be performed each year? Well, the structure of your audit program may already be dictated when you assume, assume the leadership role. But if you are able to influence it, I would recommend that the function not report directly into operations. Or if it does, that it report to the most senior leader there. This will facilitate independence of the function, transparency of the audit findings, and access to decision makers. Now, most HSE programs report to the VP or Director EHS, and that works great um, as long as there's an independent assessment of the HSE program itself periodically. A lot really depends on the safety culture of the organization, and if the leadership's fully engaged and supportive of the audits um, as a continual improvement tool, uh, where the function reports to is really not that important. The number of auditors on the team is dependent on the size and complexity of the operations to be audited. And I would recommend a small train, sorry, a small core of trained auditors <clears throat> with operations experience. This core team should be supplemented by a, train, by a pool of trained auditors and operations, and they should have a budget sufficient to hire external experts as and when required. The value in using trained auditors from operations in a pool is they get to see what their peers are doing, uh, build networks, and share best practices. The number of audits to be form performed each year, again, is a function of the number of and complexity of the operations, as well as the maturity of the organization's other business and governance processes. In an ideal world, the audit team should be checking the checkers, but often the audit team is the only and last line of defense and there's a need, for a, a, a need for a more robust number of assessments. High risk operations should probably be audited on a three year cycle and low risk operations on a lesser frequency unless they have an incident frequency that requires increased oversight. Sure, so how should one objectively track one's improvement in addressing risks with risk elimination or reduction projects? Uh, where your inventory of risk controls identifies a significant gap uh, in the adequacy or effectiveness of controls, organizations usually uh, typically implement a, 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 implement a risk reduction or, if cost effective, risk elimination projects. Tracking uh, the effectiveness of those projects over time can show how investments in time and capital can have a demonstrable reduction in the organization's overall risk profile. That data becomes very useful in a due diligence defense uh, in the event of an incident and in building business cases, cases for new risk reduction and elimination projects. You should also see a, number in the, a reduction in the number and severity of incidents and a big reduction in the number of repeat incidents. Um, obviously, risk elimination projects are preferable over risk reduction projects, um, but they can take uh, more time and capital. Sure. So how should one choose what should be audited and what metrics should be followed to measure success? Uh, in my experience, you should look at uh, inherent risks as a starting point uh, when determining what risks and controls you want to audit. And inherent risks are risks in their raw state. That's risks with no mitigating controls to reduce the potential frequency and, sever and severity uh, of consequences down to an acceptable level. So the controls associated with these high level risks are often referred to as critical controls because if they fail, the consequences can be quite devastating to the organization in terms of its reputation, finance, and potential fatalities. You should also look at a number of other inputs and those can include the number of and complexity of the auditable units within the company, the strength of the management team and the audit, auditable units risk profile, um, particularly if it manages hazardous operations. You should look to see whether it has experienced significant HSEQ incidents in the past. Is it located in an environmentally sensitive or highly populated area? 
How did it score on its last HSEQ management system self-assessment? And how long has it been since the last audit? How many high-level risks does it manage? And what's the efficacy of the associated critical controls as measured by its own performance and monitoring programs? You know, what's happening in the industry? Are there any trends there, control weaknesses that emerging there that might be considered? All those inputs should flow, think of it as a funnel, a type spreadsheet that can then be prioritized with risk-based rationale for subsequent collaboration with the affected management in the auditable unit to see if they have any higher priorities they'd like to see audited. A three to five year schedule should also be developed that covers a base of covers a base load of HSEQ management system audits and leaves room for risk-based deep dives on specific risks and controls. In terms of audits performance metrics, I think the best indicator is a reduction in the number and severity of incidents and the number of repeat incidents. Sure. So do you think that software tools to manage hazard and risk control and audit data would be helpful? Absolutely. Uh, the more automation you can you can utilize, the better. Uh, particularly if that automation puts more ownership into the hands of the frontline risk and control owners to conduct inspections, observation programs, and audits. Um, software tools often save uh, time and money in the development of risk and risk and and uh, audit reports, and they facilitate data analysis and risk transparency. Um, the best companies also use software tools to help anticipate and prevent incidents by looking at what trends are happening across the company and using that data to predict what might happen next. Sure. And one very important question. How should one avoid audit fatigue? Yeah, that's, that's a really great question and one that I get quite often. Um, the best way to avoid audit fatigue is to ensure that the efficacy of your HSEQ management system is, is really operationally excellent. If your management system is working effectively, then there should be multiple levels of governance in place with clearly identified risk and control owners, good monitoring and measuring and inspection programs that should reduce the need for a big formal audit program. Organizations can also be overwhelmed by too many corrective actions and the last thing they want is more audits driving more corrective actions. So again, it's important for that management system and audit programs to focus on critical controls and critical risks. Sure. And, last, and lastly, working collaboratively with your clients and a continual improvement culture will cut down on audit fatigue or at least the perception of it. Sure. Well, that was the last question for today. Thank you so much, John, for your time and insights. Well, if you guys have any further questions on internal audit best practices, then stay tuned because Mnemonic will hold a webinar on the subject with John as an expert on March 14, 2017. The webinar will provide much more information and you will also have a chance to ask John your questions directly. For any queries, please do not hesitate to contact us at info at Thank you and have a great day. Thank you.